posted uh, a little um, document, not a little bit, it's a document that looked like this. I asked you to print it out for today. If you didn't print it out, there's copies over there. Uh, in the back by the torso. And I thought, um, as I teach the arm, the arm muscles and the forearm muscles, they're all really close together and they're all really slender and they're very difficult to present because they're so slender and right next to each other and you look up here and you really can't see it. Okay. So uh, my strategy is to um, use the skeletal coloring pages, so to speak, and to draw each muscle individually starting with their attachments. Okay. And, um, I think that might be a good strategy to do for these muscles. The next category of muscles I have are, it says on your study, uh, study list here, the major flexor extensors of the forearm. However, I would also add arm. Let me write it on the board. Major. Yeah, let me get a that works. Flexors slash extensors of R. Slash or forearm. The tricky thing is, and this is tricky, so listen up. Students always confuse arm and forearm, the brachium and the antebrachium. not a big deal, uh, but you really do have to think a little bit on this one. What's the region of the arm? It's the region between the shoulder and the elbow. The bone of the arm is the humerus, the joint of the shoulder. What's the antebrachium? What's the region between elbow and wrist? Okay, and the two forearm bones are radius and ulna. Now that's not very confusing, but when I start asking you, which of the following flexes the arm? And you don't have it straight in your head. And you haven't quite memorized which muscles do what. You're not going to get it right. And I see this on every anatomy test for this unit. So keep very clear in your head, arm and forearm, throughout this lecture, and um, I think you'll be okay. And you'll begin to see what I say. Because some of these can flex the arm and the forearms. Some can just flex the forearm. Some can extend the arm and the forearm. Some can just extend the uh, forearm. So you have to keep it all straight. So it's just kind of cut to the chase and start going through the muscles. Biceps, brachii. Here's a muscle named for how many heads it has. Two. Bi means two. Seps means cephalos means head. The two headed muscle. Brachii refers to which region? The arm. So, two-headed muscle. Oh, the arm. This is the classic arm muscles, the ones we like to flex. Okay, your guns, as we call them. Now, interestingly, this is the major muscle of the arm. However, as we'll see, this muscle has no attachments on the arm. The arm bone is the humerus. This muscle has no attachment on the humerus. It's the major muscle of the arm. But has no attachments. on the arm. It's okay. You can attach before and after the arm and you can still move the arm in the forearm. So let's talk about its attachments. The origin, there's two of them because there's two heads. Um, 
One head is the short head. And in identifying the muscle with multiple heads, you always have to put short head of biceps brachii, right? If you're identifying it on an exam, for example. The short head originates on the <coughs> coracoid process. The long head, remember short is a relative term, so we expect there's a long head. It originates supraglenoid tubercle. That's on the scapula. Both of these are on the scapula. If you haven't mastered your bones yet, this is where anatomy starts to become overwhelming. I don't make it overwhelming. I just teach every day. You make it overwhelming if you don't stay on top of the material. Did you know that these are on the scapula? If, the, if you're down your head, yeah, you're keeping on top. If you're like, I haven't even touched it yet. I, I'm, I'm just piling on you today, and you really have to uh, try to keep up. So let's go over here. I'll use red or origin. You don't have to use red, but classically it's used. Four point process is right here. <coughs> Mm -hmm. A red dot. Superglenoid tubercle is right next to it. I put two red dots here. Okay, that, that's the origin. So that's why I kind of made a printout because you're sitting in the back and it's hard to see two little dots. So do it right in front of you. Okay, just right where it is. And um, so let's talk about where this muscle inserts. It doesn't insert on the arm. It's going to go past the elbow, and one of the insertions. Is on the radius, radial. Tuberosity. The other insertion it has is actually not on the bone. It's a connective tissue called the bicipital aponeurosis. Possibly they use uh, blue for insertion. So the radial tuberosity is right here, the little dot there. And I'll draw like a little connective tissue sheath thing uh, for the bicipital aponeurosis. Okay, so that's the radial tuberosity, and then the, the bicipital aponeurosis is actually a connective tissue, not bone. You have to make that clear. It's kind of like if you like kind of go like this. Like tense right here, and do you feel this part of your forearm all tense? The aponeurosis tenses and it kind of keeps this area stable. Uh, but anyways, let's draw the muscle going from the origin to the insertion. So I'm going to draw one head to the other head. The muscle's going to go all the way down there. from origin to insertion, and part of it's going to go here. Okay, so you have to remember your attachments. If you follow the, the head that's like um, attached to the coracoid process, I'll put S for short head and then L for long head. And so you have to be able to identify the correct head on this one. So this is the biceps brachii. So let's start to think about how it moves. This bone, this is how I think of muscles. I ask myself, what joint does it cross? Does it cross the shoulder joint? The answer is yes, because it attaches to the scapula. So you can move the glenohumeral joint. Okay. Can it move the elbow? Yes, it crosses it it crosses it distal to the joint. It can also move the proximal radial ulnar joint. Any muscle that has an attachment to the radius can make that bone radiate, so you can affect pronation supination. So this is actually being called a three-joint muscle. It can move the, um, it can move <coughs> the shoulder, the elbow, and the proximal radial ulnar joint. Okay, 
its actions are, it can flex on. It can flex forearm. It's a powerful supinator. Supinates. So that's your three joints. What joint is moving in the arm? Shoulder. Shoulder, when you flex the forearm, that's the elbow. Classic hinge joint. When you supinate, you're radiating that radius bone. Basically, we call that uh, proximal radial ulnar joint. That's the joint that's moving. actions on the um, path in a little bit. I want to go through the other two muscles that I want to uh, teach next. Uh, any questions on the bicep brachii? Now you're starting to remember what these actions are. It's like, I don't know what flex arm is. You know, and I'll animate for them to <coughs> review you, but I'm trying to gauge if you're uh, getting it yet. But we'll see. Let's do the next one the brachialis muscle. This muscle is a, it's called a, a pure flexor muscle. It doesn't really do anything else. It can flex forearm, it does nothing else. And basically, it's going to originate kind of um, shaft of the humerus. So, let's draw that. The origin is pretty extensive. It kind of like <coughs> attaches all the way up and down uh, the shaft of the humerus bone there. And it's going to insert right here, this little area here. on the ulna bone. So a muscle that goes from humerus <coughs> it's only crossing one joint the elbow. Can it move this joint? The answer is no because it's like it's not even up there. How can it move this joint if it's way down here? So that's how you have to start thinking of muscles. What joint does it cross? The elbow. Can it affect pronation supination? No. It has no attachment on the radius bone. That's another fact you should generalize. Any bone that has an attachment on the radius bone can somehow affect either pronation or supination. I'm sorry. Any muscle. <coughs> that has an attachment on the radius <coughs> can affect the 
pronation or supination. Sometimes both. This muscle, what does it insert? The ulna. That's the bone that doesn't move in pronation and supination, so it can only flex. Okay, so that's the brachialis. Notice on the last picture here, it's a posterior view because I want to present the triceps brachii. is named for having three heads. It's of the arm and basically it's on the posterior arm. It, the first two were anterior arms. So this posterior, this is your big arm muscle and um, on the back I should say. The three heads, there's a long head, there's a lateral head, and there's a medial head. origin is on the infraglenoid tubercle. The other two heads uh, basically originate posterior shaft of humerus. of the ulna. So they all insert a lepronon. Okay. So let me kind of draw that. Um, the infraglenoid tubercle is a little bump right there. <coughs> so that's the long head. That's where it originates. The other two heads um, lateral and medial. The medial has a lot of surface area on the posterior humerus. Something like that. The lateral head origin is it's lateral. It's kind of more like that. So that's medial head. That's lateral head. And that one is the long Head. It's really three heads. Usually um, the medial head is not seen, it's out of sight. But those other two heads you can usually see. So I'm just going to kind of draw a uh, big muscle. And they all converge right there on the electronaut right around there. Okay, so I just try to draw, but it's kind of sloppy, I'm trying to draw all my attachments. You can make them look prettier. The point is, you have two um, heads that you can see superficially, the long and the lateral, and the medial head is covered. You usually don't see that. <coughs> Now the question I want to ask you next is well, what joints can this move? And let's take it head by head. Can the long head move the shoulder joint? Just yes or no. The answer is, I'll just think about it. The answer is yes. <coughs> what does it attach? If you attach on the scapula, you can move the shoulder joint. So long head can move the shoulder joint. What about the other two heads? <coughs> and these two heads, 
move the shoulder if they originate on the humerus? The answer is no. You cannot move the humerus if you attach on the humerus. Okay. Uh, all right. So what can you do? This muscle can extend arm. That would be the long hand only. <laughs> and this muscle can extend the forearm, all three heads. some questions here on your, on your half sheet. Which pass is that? Who passes that? On your half sheet. <coughs> we talked about <coughs> biceps, brachii, brachialis. Triceps, brachii. And by the way, you're not turning these, you're not turning these in. It's just for study. So you are training your actions as you well know. So these three muscles that we just covered answer this question. Which can flex arm? Be specific. Number two. Which can then or you know be specific and three which can only keyword being only elbow. <coughs> Go ahead and answer those now. I'll give you just a quick minute.
All right, out of these three muscles, um, for the arm, for number, for number one, which can flex arm? You should have put the biceps brachii, um, pretty much the long head could, or the short head could. Okay, that's what I meant by be specific. Could you figure out which head did it? Well, they both do. Which could extend the forearm, uh, which can extend arm? It was supposed to be triceps brachii, but which head? Only the long head can. Okay. And for the third question, I underlined only. Which one can only flex elbow? Well, the correct answer was brachialis. Now, why isn't the biceps brachii a correct answer? Can the biceps brachii only flex the elbow? No, it can also supinate. That's what I was going for there. All right. Identify this action. That one, we bring the arm forward. When you bring the arm forward like that, we say in anatomy, you could say flex shoulder or flex arm. Okay, that's one of the actions of a uh, biceps break, yeah? That action right there. That's flex elbow, right? Right like that. Turn the palm face down, that's pronation. When you turn it face up, that's supination. So notice how the biceps lights up when you turn palms face up. Now that's supination. Okay, so pronation, supination. Uh, the biceps brachii is a powerful supinator. Like put your hand on your biceps, like when you turn a doorknob, and you kind of feel your biceps contract. Um, that's supination. Brachialis is commonly misidentified. Do you see how it's underneath the biceps brachii there? It's, it, I have it highlighted, but it's, it's hard to see. I know it doesn't project too well. Let, let me isolate it. That's what it looks like by itself. However, you have to know it's deep to the biceps. So when you look at it on our models, it it's almost a guarantee you miss it if you can't remember it's deep to the biceps. Okay. You have to practice looking at it underneath the biceps to get this one correct. Remember, this one only flexes the elbow. It attaches to the ulna. It cannot affect pronation or supination if you attach to the ulna. And the last one was the triceps brachii, so I'll turn it around at the back. That is the long head of the triceps brachii. So you have to follow, I always um, remember long and lateral because long doesn't help me. It does look a little longer, but lateral helps me because is that muscle more lateral, the one I have highlighted? Is this lateral relative to that? No, so that's not the lateral head. So this is the lateral head. I always just remember it that way. That's me. Lateral, oh, well, it's, not the, it's the long head. And what's the head you can't see? Medial. It's underneath there somewhere, which probably means I'm not going to ask you to identify that head because you can't see it on our models. But anyways, that head that's highlighted, it can extend at the shoulder and extend at the elbow. Okay. So anyways, let's look at that just to be sure we're clear on movements. So when you bring the arm back, that's extension. If you bring it back further, that's hyperextension. But anyways, the joint that's moving is the shoulder. So this muscle can extend the shoulder um, and hyperextend the shoulder like that. And so um, elbow flexion, I'm sorry, elbow extension. 
is also accomplished by this muscle. When you bring the arm down, that's extension. Now typically, you don't really need your triceps to do that because what's doing most of the work if you just let your arm drop? Gravity. Okay, so usually when you work out your triceps in the gym, you kind of have to like go like that, right? So you're fighting gravity, so you extend against a force. <clears throat> but this muscle can extend both the shoulder and the elbow. That's the triceps. So if there are no more questions, I'm going to move on. Do you have any questions about uh, these three muscles? We're going to move from arm to forearm now. We'll do the anterior forearm. So the anterior forearm is really complex. There are three layers of muscle. Okay, hear me now. There's three layers of muscle. There's not three muscles. There's three layers of muscles. There are many muscles, and you don't even have to do them all. So be thankful for that. But the ones that are on your list, okay, yeah, that, that's a pretty good list there. The first four go like this four and then go like that. That's kind of how they are um, arranged on your forearm. That's how I always remember. This really helps me because once I have to put it, the origin, on the medial epicondyle. All of these muscles originate from the medial epicondyle. So as a compartment, that's one rule we can say. Rules are good because they kind of like make everything the same for a lot of different things and it makes it easier to remember. So this is the anterior compartment. of the forearm. Remember, this is the antebrachium. As a group, if you're on the front, this is like when you did that grip test thing, that EMG lab, and you put the electrodes here. This, these are muscles that help you grip, right? So they can flex digits, they can flex the wrist. Muscles in this region can flex digits, fingers, the wrist. They can flex the elbow, but very weakly. Uh, weak elbow flexion. So I, I don't usually list those as major actions of these muscles, but generally speaking, they're flexors of those joints. Okay. Um, the other thing is that, like I just said, they basically originate from medial epicondyle. That's usually why they're Classed together. Another reason why they're kind of um, put together as a group, the innervation is um, similar. There's only two nerves that innervate all the muscles from this region. That's the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. I haven't taught those nerves yet, but just list them for now. Innervation. 
uh, not medial, median nerve on our nerve. So the innervation kind of makes it a compartment. Okay. Now, some of these finger joints uh, and wrist joints, I, I didn't mention them yet, so I need to go back and do that. I'll use the app to. Here. Some joints I haven't mentioned yet. Okay, let me zoom in on the hand wrist thing here. Let me go hand function. Okay, right there, those joints, I'm going to call it CMC for short now. Uh, this joint right there, that's the MCP, that's the PIP, that little joint there, that's the DIP. Okay, so these are wrist and finger joints. Let me tell you what these mean. <clears throat> CMC, those are, these are all acronyms for joints. That stands for carpal metacarpal. Carpo metacarpal. Well, that's the wrist bones and metacarpal are the bones of your hand, right? The bones of the palm of your hand. Let's see if I can find a nice figure for you here. Some of you probably already found the figure I'm looking for. Uh, Page 342 in this atlas is a good one. If you don't have this atlas, bring me any book, I'll show you where to find it. Carpo, metacarpal is the first one. Uh, CMC. MCP is um, metacarpal phalangeal. All right. The metacarpals, it's a joint between the metacarpals and the phalanges. Well, basically, it's your knuckles. Okay, that joint is your knuckles. Uh, the PIP, that's the proximal interphalangeal joint. DIP is the distal interphalangeal joint. So if I take my index finger and go like that, which joint am I moving? PIP or DIP? The PIP, but if I go like that, can you see me do that? Uh, what am I doing? That's that's DIP. All right. Okay. Now let's think about the thumb. The thumb only has one interphalangeal joint, so you just call it IP, okay? Because there's no proximal or distal. It's just one interphalangeal joint, the thumb. So I'll just put IP. Pollock's only interphalangeal joint. Okay. All right. So those are the joints. Let me uh, go back.
Sorry, let's go back to the doc. That is correct. Thumb has this one and one of these. That's it. Thumb only. All right, so the first, I have four here because I want to teach these first four muscles. They kind of lay across your hand like this. It goes pronator teres, second finger, um, flexor carpi radialis, third finger, um, palmaris longus, uh, fourth finger, flexor carpi ulnaris. And I have them listed in that order on your study list. Pronator teres first. Well, this muscle is named for what it does and its shape. It pronates and it's a long, round muscle. Pronator teri pronates. I'm always amused. Well, I shouldn't be amused, but sometimes I try to make it easy for you on a test. And I say, what's the action of this muscle? And you sit there and you think, what is it? Pronator teres, what does it do? Right, because you just did the brute force memorization thing. And you didn't try to make it easy for yourself. The name of the muscle is what it does in that case. So, uh, if I if I give you an easy easy one, just take it. Okay, don't overthink it. Pronator teres, it pronates. Okay, that's an easy one. If I ask you that, it could also flex the uh, flex the elbow, but we'll just go with pronates. That muscle again, these all originate where? Medial condyle. Yeah. Yeah, I always go like this to help me remember. Oh, that's the medial epicondyle. Because I, I can't do it like that. I can't do it on the other one. I do it like this. Medial epicondyle. And it's going to um, insert kind of mid shaft radius. And remember our rule any muscle that attaches to the radius can affect pronation or supination. This one pronates. So it originates. No, I use red for originate. Okay, originates there. There's my medial epicondyle, right? It's gonna like go to somewhere around here. Right there. Okay. Origin to insertion from red to blue. So I'm going to draw a muscle that goes from one to the other. Okay, that's pronator teres. Let's move on. Um, next one flexor carpi radialis. This muscle is named for its action. It's a flexor. The question becomes, what does it flex? Wrist. This muscle can flex the wrist. The radialis tells you it's on that side. The forearm, like there's a radial side, that's your thumb side. The pinky side is the ulnar side. They call it radialis. It's pretty much on that side of the forearm. Okay. Flexor carpi radialis. The origin is the same. Okay, medial epicondyle. And the insertion is going to insert <coughs> past the wrist, um, past the carpal bones, at the base of the second metacarpal.
Well, let me draw that here. So this first one was the pronated teres. Let's now do flexor carpi radialis. I'm not sure if it's carpi or carpi. I'm pretty sure it's carpi, although it doesn't matter. Um, spell it right, right? That's what counts. Okay, it originates medial epicondyle. Let's look at the base of. The second metacarpal right there, it's going to insert right there. When I work with cadavers, I always try to follow the tendon to number one, or right? number two, gives you number two, always follow it to there. And, oh, okay, that must be, I mean, that's how I identify muscles. I know the attachments. I know it's a headache for students, um, but this, this is anatomy. I'm an anatomist. This is how I identify muscles. I know their attachments. I just follow to the attachment. I pull on them. I see what they do. This is why we teach it. Um, okay, so you draw muscle from there all the way there. These are all very slender muscles. Right next to each other, these two. Uh, the next one is palmaris longus. of this one before I move away from it, flex wrist. But if you're on the radialis side and you can pull, let's say you can um, you can have abduction or adduction of the wrist. Abduct, adduct. But if you're pulling from the thumb side, are you going to abduct the wrist or adduct the wrist? What do you think? If you pull, you're going to like abduct the wrist. It can also do that, uh, but that's a minor action. So I'll throw that one in there just to get you to associate. If it's on the radialis side, you abduct. If you're on the ulnar side, you adduct. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What? No, it doesn't do that. It doesn't affect that. Yeah. So what's the rule about um, pronation, supination? What does it have to attach to which bone? The radius. This one doesn't quite do it. It goes past the radius and inserts on a metacarpal. All, right. All right, so the next one is flexor, no, palmaris. This is absent in some people. Some books say 11%, some books say 14%. If you want to, if you want to know if you have yours, just kind of go like that. Oh, I see my tendon. It's right there, right in the middle. So you have a tendon right in the middle, and you have one. Maybe you don't, or maybe you have one, you just can't see the tendon. But it is absent in some people. I've never seen a cadaver without one. Okay. Um, so this is a very long, slender muscle. It originates, again, medial epicondyle. And it inserts, not on bone, but on a connective tissue called the palmar aponeurosis. It's kind of a triangular shaped connective tissue deep in the palm of your skin, deep in the palm of your, um, in your palm. Palmar aponeurosis. This can flex the wrist. It can also tense the palm of skin. This is inserting on this connective tissue deep to the skin. Hence, skin of palm. Flex wrist. Palmaris longus is named for basically this reason, tense palm of skin. 
there's a brevis, but you don't have to know it. That's why the term longus is used, because there's also a palmaris brevis, but, but not, that's not in your study list. So, uh, originates. Medio hippocondyle. So I'm gonna draw like a triangular shape. That represents palmar aponeurosis down there on the hand. It's about very long, but both very slender muscle that attaches there. The tendon is very long in this muscle. So where I stopped coloring it in red, that's about how long the tendon is. It's very long. Palmaris, longus, and uh, moving on. Okay, the, the fourth muscle here is the um, flexor carpi, flexor carpi ulnaris. That's a muscle on the ulnar side, the pinky side. It can also flex wrist, but because it's pulling on the ulnar side, it can adduct wrist, a reduction <coughs> of the wrist. It originates on the medial epicondyle and it inserts the base of the fifth metacarpal. Base of it. So base means it's more proximal, right? So right. Put the dot there. So from there to there. It's a rather large flat muscle. Well, anyways, look for it on our model, see how they model it. I had a student once say, I didn't come to college to, to color. <laughs> Don't put it beneath you. Coloring will help you in anatomy. I don't really use it as a presentation tool, but I still remember that I colored trapezius green and rhomboids uh, orange and Christmas dorsi yellow from like 25 years ago. It's like memory burn. It really does help some people. All right, let's look these muscles on the app. in yellow is the bicipital aponeurosis. I thought I'd point it out to you since I did it before when I presented the biceps brachii. So the bicipital aponeurosis is a connective tissue. And do you see how it's kind of like over the four forearm muscles I just taught? Here it is right there. So you tense the biceps brachii. It helps stabilize and hold these muscles down. It's like biological spandex holds them in place. Well, anyways, those four muscles that I just presented, I'm gonna hide the brachial radialis. Hide you, okay, there we go. First muscle of the four, okay, I went like that. That first muscle is the pronator teres. I'm gonna isolate it. The 
that's kind of how we drew it. Coordinator Terry's. You can see it's inserting on which bone? Okay, what does it do again? It pronates. Pronator teres pronates. Um, okay, the next muscle is the flexor carpi radialis. So there it is. They just kind of show you the metacarpals uh, as followed to its insertion. Right there, base of second. Well, technically, base of second and third metacarpal. Just, just go with the second. It's mostly second metacarpal is what you see there. Okay. Next muscle, palmaris longus. It's very slender, has a long tendon. Uh, isolated. They show you it inserting on nothing. Because remember, it inserts on connective tissue. So for you to see that, uh, I have to go back and I have to turn on connective tissue. And I think that's it. The one layer here. There it is in uh, <clears throat> in green. Uh, let me see what it does when I isolate it. Right here. So what's in green is called the palmar aponeurosis. Um, a nice long tendon. Sometimes that muscle is used as a tendon graft for other procedures. Okay, and the last muscle I presented was on this one there. No, that's not it, sorry. It's on the ulnar side. It's the flexor carpi ulnaris. Let me isolate it. There it is on the ulnar side, and it inserts on the base of the fifth metacarpal. They don't show it quite going there, but it does. They show it going to PC form. But anyways, when you study the forearm, get straight in your head, radius and ulna. Okay, the radius, I always remember thumb, rad, radial side, the ulnar side. If you, you get the radius and the ulnar straight, you'll be good with the, uh, this region here. But I'm gonna move on. Okay, I have a um, muscle called the flexor digitorum superficialis. The flexor digitorum superficialis. flexor digitorum superficialis. The muscle is named for what it flexes. Digitorum obviously means digits, flexes digits. Um, superficialis is a relative term. There's a deeper one. 
It's called profundus, flexor digitorum profundus, but that's not on your study list. Uh, so we, we'll just stick with the superficialis one. Okay. This muscle flexes digits, <clears throat> but since I taught all those joints, it inserts on the, well, it can flex all the way to the PIP, basically. So you can do this. Uh, all the way up to PIP joints of digits two to five, these four fingers. It also originates <coughs> medial epicondyle. <coughs> it's going to branch out into um, four tendons that will each, you have to think about this, if you can flex the PIP joint that means you have to attach past it. So it attaches on this phalange. That's your middle phalange. Okay. The middle phalanx of each of those digits. So it inserts on middle phalanges of digits two through five. I'll go over here and I'll draw a little origin on the, uh, again, medial epicondyle. It's going to insert on the sides of the middle, right here, digits two, insert there, through five. So there are four tendons that are going to go all the way down to there. So what happens is the um, muscle starts out. You may see multiple heads on this muscle. Okay, sometimes I, I do see that. So I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to illustrate that a little bit. But basically, what you should see is that there are going to be four tendons. that go to those digits. so you get four tendons going there. Don't worry about necessarily identifying different heads, although I have seen that quite a bit in our cadavers. Um, the muscle flexes the digits. That's basically it. Let's move on. Let's see here. Aha, next muscle. Um, bit of a correction here. I have supinator listed next. Technically, supinator is on the posterior compartment of the forearm. But you can see it from the anterior compartment, so I think that's why I listed it there. But to be technical, and we like to be technical in anatomy, um, we might have a board. Correction. 
know it as being a member of the posterior compartment of the forearm. But I'll present it here. You can't see it from the anterior view. So this is the FDS, short for Flexor Digitorum Superficialis, Supernator. So it's posterior, so the origin is actually the electron on it. It's behind here. Um, so I'll kind of like put some, dot, some dots there to illustrate it's behind it. But what it's going to do, it's going to wrap around. Um, I should probably write that down here since I'm not. Let me write the origin. The attachments first. Origin. Do you remember what bone that is? Ulna. It's going to insert proximal radius. Right around here. It asserts on the proximal radius pretty much between radial tuberosity uh, and the insertion of the pronator teres. So the muscle's going to wrap around. It's a hard one to find. It's kind of back and it wraps around the front. But what it's going to do, because it's starting from the back and going to the front here, when it pulls, it's going to supinate. So if you're pronated, this muscle can pull it, supinate it. That might be one that might be more clear when I show you on the uh, app. And you know what? I don't even like how I drew it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to redo it. Sorry that messes you up. Should be more down here. I drew, I drew too proximal. Bit of a perfectionist. Okay. Kind of more like that. That's a tough one to draw. It's better just to look at it on the models and on apps. But if you know where it originates and you know where it inserts, you know what it does. I won't even put its action, so don't ask me later. You didn't tell me the action of supinator. I'm gonna like look at your cross side. Huh? What do you think it does? It supinates. The muscle is named for its action. People say, there are no dumb questions. That's kind of dumb. You didn't tell me this. Okay. I guess I can tell you. Sometimes you like you to think just a little bit before you ask the question. The next one is pronator quadratus. This muscle is named for its action. What does it do? Pronates also named for its shape. That implies it has four sides. It's a four, it's a basically a square-ish looking muscle. 
Um, so it pronates, it originates, I want to say distal ulna. It inserts distal radius. between those two. Okay, so you're just going to pull this way for uh, formation. So I said that the, the anterior compartment has three layers of muscle. The first four are considered the superficial layer. The FDS is like intermediate. <coughs> this muscle is the deepest layer. When I say first four, you know, that's these. The next one is flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi. Ulnarius. First four superficial. I gave you one in intermediate zone, FDS. one deep pronator. I didn't teach all the muscles, okay? There, there are more in the deep layer, but it's enough. Pronator uh, quadratus. Remember, I didn't put supinator here because technically it's posterior compartment. Do you know, know the supinator? Uh, let, me, let me show you these muscles on the app. Okay, that's the FDS, flexor uh, digitorum superficialis. Okay, so what I like is, um, if you zoom in, if you're playing with the app at home, that's what the muscle looks like. Just follow the tendons.
I want to zoom in on more. I don't got it super zoomed in, but you should be able to identify that bone that it's inserting on. It's the middle uh, phalanx, right? So it complex the PIP, that's what I emphasize there. Flex digits. Well, let's just see that animated. I mean, it's like gripping something. That's flex fingers. But you can also flex the wrist. Wrist flexion looks like this. That's wrist flexion right there. So this animation, they're flexing the fingers and the wrist. First thing, flex fingers. Second thing, flex wrist. Okay, that's, so that's what they're showing you there. You can do all of that. Even though it's not in the name, it can do that. All right, so let's look at the other muscles here. Um, let's try to find supinator. There it is right there, supinator. I'm going to isolate it so you can see what it looks like. So here's the supinator muscle. You can see it from the anterior view, but it's categorized in the posterior compartment there. Okay. So let's look at supination again uh, one more time. I like that you can kind of really zoom in on it with the app. And the muscle lights up when it pulls the radius outward like that. That's supination right there. Supinator. And the last muscle I did was a pronator. It's a deep muscle. You see how it's underneath all of those tendons? And do you see how all of those tendons run under a, a very dense connective tissue called the flexor um, retinaculum? They call it transverse carpal movement here. Let's see if my flexor right now. But what I want you to see here that there's connective tissue structures that hold these tendons down, these four. These four are of the FDS. Do you see how they get, come down here and then they kind of like fan out uh, to there? So you do a lot of keyboard work and you irritate the median nerve that's there. And that's what they call the carpal tunnel syndrome because there's a tunnel underneath there. But that's a clinical side note. Uh, I wanted to show you pronator quadratus. <clears throat> Isolated. Right there. It's just a square. And its action is pronation. So that's supination, but then pronation is turning your palm face down. Okay, let me ask you some more half sheet questions. We're on number four, right? Two muscles that supinate, two muscles that pronate. Two muscles that supinate, two muscles that pronate. Well, one's right there. Let's see here. Name the insertion name the insertions plural for two muscles flexor carpi radialis flexor carpi ulnaris.
number six. Name the most distal joint that FPS can flex. You can flex a lot of joints. What's the most distal one? Let's remember what distal means, like the furthest one out from the trunk. So we'll make that four, five, and six and give you a couple minutes. Once you're done with those, why don't we go ahead and take our break, and when we come back from break, just go right into lab, just study time, your favorite, right? I'll finish the muscles on Monday. Okay, so whenever you're done, just kindly exit for your break. Come back around 9.15.